Uh, and both at the time and years after, she uh, assured us we were never more obnoxious uh, than that summer we first started dating and fell in love. Uh, she said it was the most ridiculous thing she'd ever seen, that we'd be uh, in conversation with her, and then one of us uh, would happen to uh, start looking over at, at, at the other and totally lose focus. She said, talking to any one of you, if the other was anywhere in the room, was just worthless. Uh, she called it being Twitter-pated from Bambi, and uh, uh, just said it was, it was too cute, it was too ridiculous. She uh, was very glad that we settled into each other and weren't quite as obnoxious as that very first summer. These are one of the joys of being married to a spouse, is all these stories get shared over time. Uh, but that's a little bit about what Solomon is, is come to understand his relationship to God to be about. Uh, that the only metaphor that really could capture what he feels for God, his absolute takenness with God, uh, is a love letter, is a love poem uh, where the imagery is incredibly uh, powerful and beautiful uh, and as one lover would talk to another. Come away with me. Last week we had Solomon uh, uh, adorning the temple with prayer and it was finally completed and his joy in being able to uh, have, have a place for God and he begins with prayer of gratitude and this week we have him uh, just expressing the absolute holistic love that he has for his Lord. And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful that a lot of people, when they get married, love it because it's just a good love poem. And I keep reminding them it is a great love poem, but it's about people's love for God, which we point to in your marriage. Uh, but don't forget, this is about the kind of love uh, that, uh, that Solomon shares for God and that, that hopefully the love that binds you together points towards. Uh, but it is a beautiful metaphor. And it is a beautiful metaphor because we all understand that feeling of first falling in love and how uh, head over heels we are in every moment is guided towards that person, uh, towards thinking about what they're doing, about uh, bringing them flowers or writing them a note or, uh, you know, it just is all consuming and that's what God wants of us. God wants us to have God that central in our lives, to be able to be that full of the love of God that money and greed and all the other things of this world fall away. That we're so distracted by the love of God that those things have less meaning. I tell people as they get married, I said, you know, I am confident that you two coming into a priest's office to listen to me drone on and on for uh, five sessions are deeply in love or you wouldn't be sitting here today. That your lives have been drawing themselves towards one another uh, and that you are moving rapidly towards one another in passionate love. And I said, you know, marriage is wonderful. I can't say enough wonderful things about marriage, uh, but it takes protecting that, that, that pull towards one another. Because sometimes in long work weeks and raising children and in the years, sometimes we need to hold on tightly to what brought you into this room. So my assignment for them is to come up with five things that they hope doesn't change about their relationship or about the person sitting next to them. Five things that you do together that is part of just your natural response of love for one another, whether it be uh, walks after dinner, whether it be uh, a weekly date night, whether it be the way that you talk about your day when you get home, whatever it is that you all treasure about your relationship, protect it. Make it a discipline. So what does this have to do with the rest of the readings? I think that is what we will eventually find out is what happened in the gospel. That what was originally a response became a discipline, but if we don't worry and protect it, it can become hollow. So all of these readings, I think, intersect perfectly with one another. So you have uh, Solomon's response to God. And then we have the epistle, the epistle from James, uh, which I think is one of the most beautiful uh, books in the Bible. Uh, it's written like a letter, even though it's not a letter to somebody. It's written like a letter, uh, and they believe it's, uh, it's at least uh, believed to be penned uh, by Jesus' brother James. Uh, but it was actually stricken from Scripture because uh, Martin Luther, as he was railing against uh, indulgences and some of the... Uh, uh, 
some of the uh, practices of the church during the Reformation uh, felt like it pointed towards uh, a works righteousness, that, uh, that we get our place in heaven uh, by doing enough good works. And I don't think that's what James is talking about at all. I think James has an understanding that the church or the individual, when filled with that kind of love that we get in the Song of Solomon, that kind of absolutely possessing love of God can't help but spill that love out into the world. If you are that full of the love of God, if you are that grateful for all that God has done, if you can make that kind of love song to God, it will show. You will walk outside those doors and people will know there is something different about your life by the way that you care for the other, by the way you care for the orphan, uh, the way that you care for the Sarodi student, uh, the way that you care for the hungry, the way that you care for one another in your grief and in your joys. If you are that filled with the Spirit and with faith, you can't help but have it be a response, uh, your life to be a response to that. And that's what James is talking about. Be doers of the word not just hearers. By your works, people will see your faith, your love of God, your understanding of God's love of you. Have it turned outwards. And what a beautiful way to start that James talks about. Uh, be quick to listen. Slow to talk. Slow to anger. And be filled with your faith. Take your faith seriously seriously enough that it provokes you to go and be a different kind of person, a different kind of body of Christ, a different kind of church. It provokes you to want to reign in that beautiful vision of the kingdom of God here and now. And that's what James is passionate about. So now let's go to the gospel. And the gospel, I think, uh, talks about Jesus' desire for our lives to be spilled out. What comes out of us what we do with our hands, what we say to those in grief, what we do with our lives is what God is invested in. Not necessarily what we consume, uh, not necessarily uh, the rules that we follow, but what is our response to God's goodness and God's grace in our lives. And I think originally, and I think the Pharisees and scribes, they're not doing anything wrong. Originally, the law was given so that the folks who received Bread in the wilderness understood this was a gift from God. So that every time they ate and they shared a meal, they understood this was sacred time, that God had indeed provided for them yet again, just as God had provided for them the day before, and so that their hearts would never stop being grateful. Much like showing up with flowers. At first, this was a response. Then it became a discipline in the law so that we were always reminded uh, to be grateful to God and to set apart this time, this holy time that we, uh, that we share a meal together, that this is special time. And pretty soon, uh, whether you washed your hands and whether you washed your pots and whether you prepared the food and who was at your table and who wasn't, began to be more important than what it pointed to. It's like if you show up and you give flowers every week, but it no longer becomes a sacrament of your love for the other, it loses some of its value. And that's what Jesus is saying. There's nothing wrong with all of the law and all the preparation, but if you begin to think that's the end, then you've missed it. Just like as we gather at the table, it is a wonderful gift in the way that our service works. The very next thing after we receive God's grace and God's goodness in the bread and the wine is we're catapulted out of these walls into the world to go and minister. But if coming to church and receiving Eucharist becomes the end point, the high point of our connection to God, uh, of, of our uh, even contemplating the love of God, then it's missed the boat. We're supposed to be fed and filled so that we can be like Solomon in his loving response to God and so that we can be like James calls us to be, to let our faith compel us outside of these doors to minister to one another and to minister to the world. So like that colleague says, may our faith, may all the love that showered upon us transform us so that our true faith may be revealed not in our words, but in how we carry ourselves, how we live our lives, how we go out and try to build God's kingdom here on earth so that our grace and all the love that we've received can be showered upon others 
who come to know that God is, in fact, in their lives, loving them just as we are loved. Amen.